सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट केयरफुली डॉन सेवरल है फाउंडर ऑफ व्हाइट हेट जूनियर विच वॉज लेटर अक्वाइर्ड बाई बाई जूस ही इज करेंटली हेडिंग अनदर स्टार्टअप एंड इज ऑल्सो स्पेशल एडवाइजर टू to go our chief minister well meet karan bajaj welcome karan to the print thank you neelam my and pleasure and at the same time amit all this you have also taken out time to write your fourth book uh, called the freedom manifesto well how, how do you manage to do all this this is your fourth book yeah uh, the books i've written before have been novels fiction and uh, in general i think the pattern that i've typically followed is that i've uh, you know worked on something very intensely and shared my learnings through like a uh, through my writing uh, for a period of time and then worked on something intensely again and shared my period uh, shared my learnings on uh, through writing so uh, you know that's how i managed to write my books along the journey yeah. well you've popularized online coding for children in india and at the same time you know there were concerns that were raised by critics as well as parents that you know we are depriving our children of their childhood you know at a time when they should be playing you know doing other activities we are sort of you know asking them to you know we are sort of burdening them with this coding and how how, how do you see all of that so i'll say um the essence of why i started the company my own kids were 5 and 3 at the time that i'd started white hat junior the whole idea was that uh, when i saw the education system they were going to be a part of i saw it very similar to how we grew up and i always thought that the missing thesis was that my life truly changed when i wrote my first novel at age 28 or so and i think the moment i did my first creative endeavor i really saw that my world really broadened up so i always thought that my kids should be builders and creators and the idea of starting white hat junior was that when kids code there is a lot of wonderful research on how they start to see the world as something that's created by someone and i can create it too because unlike say maths which is binary 4 plus 2 is always equal to 6 in coding you can put different objects together and get incredible outcomes and when a kid sees that happen they get this feeling that look i can be a creator and i can build and create things in this world right. so that was the idea of starting white junior and that was that uh, idea of starting coding i we never thought of it as a burden at all i think uh, you kids today will use technology you can either use technology as a consumer or a creator the whole idea was that uh, the earlier you start to realize that you are a creator of technology right the more you will create things in the world of technology well my colleague sonia agarwal has been covering education and startup yeah. very closely she will have a lot of question for oh, you I'm but sure. uh, i i just wanted to also ask you about you know you talked about this writing experience i'm sure a lot of people have already asked you this several times yes. but you've said that you know uh, writing experience made you a good entrepreneur because it sort of normalized rejection for you yeah. if i am not uh, wrong uh, your book uh, the seeker was rejected over 60 time by uh, many publishers so yeah. how, how, can you elaborate on that how how exactly uh, did that happen yeah i think overall the writing and entrepreneurship li- link was exceptionally significant so the if you look at the the whole chain of writing first you have to believe that you have an idea that can turn from a blank page into a 300 page novel right and for the year 18 months 2 years that you are writing uh you have to have that very mad sense of self belief that look i'm writing something one which one day will turn into a a, right. a book that people read our startups are very similar on your first day like i was the head of discovery in india i was the head of discovery channel in india and the first day i started writer junior immediately after that you were in a room alone and you were calling 60 70 parents trying to tell them what coding is what online classes are why you should take it So writing is very similar you have to have this own belief in yourself that look i've got something that will turn into a novel so i think that helped me a lot plus uh, whenever you do a 0 to 1 journey and i've been lucky to see three industries very closely novels startups and uh, media you see a very common pattern that 90% of creative endeavors fail so right. novels published by known publishers 90% of them fail to make money 90% of tv channels or movies fail to make money and 90% of startups fail So whenever you do a zero to one idea, it's always at the edges of a system. It's never at the center of it, 
and as a result of that nobody knows which will go from the edge to the center so you'll face tremendous amount of rejections on the way so as you rightly said my third novel was rejected 61 times i was trying to okay. get it published in the us uh, although i had done novels before in india which had done well yet i was a new author in the us and through a period of 18 months it kept getting rejected by everybody eventually random house picked it up after 18 months of like constant rejection 60 times so when i started white hat junior i was kind of very okay with this idea that look i'll be sitting alone or uh, with a blank page in a way and one day if i keep showing up every day mm. and keep focusing on my input one day it will turn into a company i've experienced that before so that it, it will like, take like, time it'll take time and then since uh, zero to one ideas will always be at the edges of a system i'll keep getting rejected in that journey so i was uh, rejected obviously as every entrepreneur is in the beginning right. by venture capitalists by your consumers by everybody <laughs> like you know even like even despite the fact that i had a good a reasonably good background before that when you were trying to get your first laptops for seven people even th- even though you know the company was venture funded at that point of time even then they required a credit history of the company you know you can't even get laptops you know or at least <laughs> at that point of time you couldn't even get laptops to rent that easily so you're just rejected throughout the day in some form or the other and it's uh, humbling for somebody who's doing it the first time but had experience it in writing before so it was comparatively right. easier sonia yeah. uh, so you know you spoke quite in detail about white hat junior yeah. and you started it in 2018 but uh, you know it was launched before the pandemic and you yeah. know it really r- peaked during uh, yeah. the pandemic the lockdown per se with a lot of students switching to online yeah. options but currently the edtech uh, you know sector yeah. the market is uh, kind of i i think i wouldn't be wrong if i said it's kind of crashing it's seeing a lot of problems so one do you think uh, you got out at the right time two uh, what do you think the future look li- looks like or what do you think is the scope now for the edtech sector it's a great question um i have like two theses on it right the 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 latter thesis which you're saying did i get out at the peak maybe that's correct i won't be uh, like uh, it'll be wrong to say that uh, you know that truly was the peak of uh, online learning because there mm. was a massive spurt in adoption the uh, one time adoption and which i thought would continue the other thesis though is that what i have learned with startups through my own experiences is that if your product experience is 10 times superior to the alternate but it can't be four or five or seven times it has to be 10 times superior to the alternate because there's so many barriers for a startup to get established then no matter which sector you are in which field you are in the company does well So when I did White Hat Junior for the first time uh you think about it the alternate experience for kids was that they would go to some neighborhood class to do some creative exercise maybe learn some chess here for the first time this was at your home it was a organized program in which you could go from zero to building an app it was truly a 10x experience versus what um, you know uh, existed in that world the offline world so the company actually did very well from the start kept building up got a huge spurt in pandemic but after that a uh, lot of people have come into the play obviously it was very attractive mm-hmm. because we, we did well and i guess the question remains that if we can truly create a 10 times more better experience than anything else then the users will keep adopting a startup that's that's how i've seen basically mm-hmm. most startups adopt right there's always a habit change period but if mm-hmm. it's 10 times better than a user habit mm-hmm. then it does work So you're saying it will essentially work irrespective of I think of so I think at tech in general hmm. if it's giving a 10 times superior experience than the physical uh, counterpart hmm. then it will work I think I've seen at tech players are getting into offline if they are truly giving a 10 times superior experience than other players then people will use their options but startup rules don't change if it's not 10x better then I've seen that startups will struggle because uh, user adoption to new habits is so hard that you have to be completely superior to their current habit right. so i feel like any company which does that in edtech or any other field will do well right you know just taking a step back yes, from your uh, edtech experience and your entre- entrepreneurship yes. journey uh, you were also the head of discovery in yes. india and i think it was if i'm not wrong you've mentioned in your book as well you were the head of the operations here when yes. uh, prime minister narendra modi agreed to be yeah. on man versus yes. wild yeah. Uh, and that was the first time a sitting leader agreed to be on the show yeah. so what was one the process like of you know getting him on uh, what was the process like while he was shooting when you know and eventually when it was aired what was the whole you know atmosphere the process yeah. everything like so the process in the beginning was i would say uh you know whatever the political views be like because i'm not commenting on that but hmm. as a uh, as a leader i thought he was incredibly open minded <laughs> you know so when we 
like when we first came up with that idea in the office that we should get Bear Grylls here, we spoke to Bear Grylls. So we called him on the phone and we said, look, we want you to come for this. He was trying to come to India for 11 years or 12 years before that. He really wanted to do something in India. Okay. He thought he would do it with an actor and we said, no, we want to do it with the premier and we are going to pitch it to him. And he was very game. Bear Grylls was very game. I would say uh, Mr. Modi and his team is extremely open-minded to take such a kind of wild idea. He had a little bit of like initial thing, but he after that kind of embraced it and I think did very well. And then I think the shooting experience for the team who went for it was, uh, you know, fascinating. You know, he's again very humble and uh, very gracious during the shoot. And then I left right before it was aired, but obviously it was a great phenomenon to have it aired, uh, to see it in uh, aired, of course, yeah. Well, you've answered it, you know, partially, but I would like to just yes. delve a bit deeper in it. You know, there have been a number of layoffs, shutdowns and, you know, um, funding crunch that is being witnessed by Indian startups. Yeah. So yeah. do you think their party is sort of over? What what exactly is going wrong with Indian startups? I, I think uh, some of them are doing very well. I think the core remains that if the, so I think there are two parts to it again. If you have a 10x product, you'll survive in the long term and you'll thrive. De definitely versus the physical alternative mm. or the digital alternative whichever you have a 10x product if you don't you'll always struggle because startups are tough the second is i think there's a lot of entrepreneur bashing about the exits and all of that stuff or the layoffs right. to say that they should somehow have been so calibrated to know exactly what the growth trajectory will be that's also very unfair in a way because uh, as i said startups are always existing on the edges of a system Airbnb, for example, was uh, mm. re uh, was rejected 12 times. You look at that startup and say, oh, what is wonderful startup? It was rejected by almost all top venture capitalists in Silicon Valley, right? So can the startup go from the edges to the center? Once it goes to the center, will it go from a niche to a very large scale? Uh, can coding for kids become so huge? I mean, at the time of the pandemic, we were doing about $100 million plus of revenue. Could coding for kids become... Nobody can truly predict that after yeah. something goes well then everybody has a story after something doesn't go well then everybody has a story so at some point you have to also cut some slack that every entrepreneur i know is doing their best you know to keep their companies alive floating the i've lived through that experience for years where uh, you know you sleep uh, you like your sleep at night is completely driven by can i make payroll this month nobody gets up thinking let me fire people you know and somehow I get valuations. I mean, people don't think like that. They think in terms of the best for uh, getting their product out to the user. So I think both sides are wrong. I think bashing them too much for uh, like uh, like things that, uh, you know, like are unpredictable, fundamentally not unpredictable. It's fundamentally, un it's not Procter & Gamble. I worked with Procter & Gamble, so it's not a steady business in which a detergent is used every month. So you can predict how much detergent is going to be used for the next. It's a, it's a zero to one business in which you don't, predi you can't predict what the, the chasm is where are the you know wh where is the adoption curve going to be are early mm. adopters going to turn into large scale adopters in as quickly you don't know that right. and you do your best to predict it but a lot of startups at least as far as yeah. india is concerned you know uh, startups are sort of you know intrinsically linked with innovation Correct. but so far you know in india what is happening is that if someone is making an app then there are 10 others who will just replicate that model so do you think that you know the the fact that innovation should be sort of the focal point yeah. that is in a way missing uh, in the indian setup i'm actually seeing quite the opposite maybe maybe my uh, glasses are different colored here okay. but i think i'm seeing the opposite which is i think it's a phenomenal I, I think the country is phenomenal where lots of ideas that emerge are not the Uber for India or mm. the Amazon for India, but they are the for Indian models, right? We have so many examples, like Misho is an example, you know, uh, Uran is an example. I think all the, they've, they've come up with like completely for India models. I would say Whitehead Junior at that point of time when I started, again, there was no reference for a live online coding platform anywhere in the world at any scale. So right. uh, I would actually say in general, people are innovating a lot here. Right. Yeah. And you know, since going back to your book, yes. you mentioned that, you know, of course, there's seven steps to financial management and planning. And yeah. you mentioned that you wish that somebody would have yeah. actually said these things to you when you were, yeah. uh, you know, in your journey. Um, so now that you've experienced it and you've come to this conclusion, what is your advice or what how would you break down these seven steps into simpler uh, ideas or uh, understanding points for um, people who are starting right now, say yeah. students, for example, or entrepreneurs who are yeah. on the uh, way of making yeah. it? I would say the book is truly not about financial management. Freedom hmm. manifest, hmm. manifest of the book. The real reason why I wrote the book 
at age 22 or whenever I graduated from IM 22, 23, I am Bangalore. I had this firm sense of conviction because of the views of everybody around me that there's one strong part to success. You join a company, you join an industry, you do very well at it, you keep working on it. And uh, and my soul was a bit different. Like I didn't, uh, I was like um, a wanderer, if you will, for uh, la lack of any other word, right? So I left my job in Procter & Gamble to backpack uh, in Brazil and uh, South America and Central Europe at uh, like midway into my career, wrote a novel, then left my job again after that to go very deep into my yoga and meditation practice, then left my job to become a full-time writer. In the, in the parallel, I was very serious about my job and kept doing well, but I had these very sudden, intense growth experiences or growth needs and I would follow them. And what I learned at the end of this journey was that actually you can achieve all the conventional parameters by following your own soul's calling because uh, the world eventually rewards your growth. So if you are growing very significantly in fields that are abstract and tangential, it's okay. That's, that's a path, right? So for example, when Discovery was looking for a CEO in India, I was among the young CEOs in that time because they were looking for somebody with very deep creative expertise and who knew how to run a business well. They found this very unique person who had written novels and had had a career with Procter & Gamble Craft, etc. So they chose me. Whitehead Jr., as I said, the whole idea came to me because I was like, kids should build and create because of my writing experiences. I launched Whitehead Jr. in the US early because uh, I was a backpacker. I believed that all the world was same. Uh, so the whole idea of writing the book was that when you uh, take this very wandering, divergent path, it actually is not a wandering, divergent path all these multiple streams, the dots connect. As long as you're growing tremendously as a person, that's the only kind of barrier you should put to yourself that are you growing tremendously as a person. So I guess mm. part of the reason I wrote the book was mm. in this wandering path, I discovered some rules. Like mm. for example, the first time I left my job to backpack, I was very tense. Next time I left my job to learn yoga and meditation, I was probably even more tense. Ki at least first time I had some reason I was writing a book. Next time I was just like living in an ashram in India, right? What will I tell people? But then when you look at uh, hard maths here, it takes only 60 days to find a job in India after you lose it. Right? Uh, mathematically, when you look mm. at a large scale research, it takes 60 days to find a job. If I had known that at that point of time, probably I would have been much more uh, comfortable taking those leaps of faith. Uh, so I think part of why I wrote the rules was, Ki, look, if there's another 21 year old who doesn't, whose soul is saying that, look, they have to live a different kind of a life, a wider life of experience, it's perfectly fine. You'll actually end up with some ups and downs. You're like going to end up in the same path as somebody who chose a narrow vertical to excel in. And that's fine. And so that's kind of the reason. I mean, I'm not writing about financial investing and stuff. They're much better mm. people than me on how to put money in the stock market. I don't want to. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> essentially, you've so. written and you've experienced, like, you know, basically reinventing your pitch on how to sell yourself and who to be. And currently, you know, we're witnessing in the yeah. market right now, in the current industry right now, we're witnessing a lot of. Uh, millennials and Gen Z's resigning, we're calling it the great yeah. resignation. Uh, so one, they will have to reinvent themselves when they go, uh, yeah. go back again to the industry. Yeah. And one, the other thing is looking for something that, you know, helps you feel that sense of satisfaction, yeah. which obviously was missing in the job in the first yeah. place is why they resigned. So what do you think are the two things that you would like to tell them? One, how do you reinvent your pitch? And two, you know, that sense of it, seeking that sense of achievement from where do you think will that come from? I can tell you what worked for me was that I chose very deep growth experiences and saw them through. So I didn't take a year off to, you know, uh, to I guess um, find myself and do like nothing in the sense. I would, uh, for example, take a year to write a book and not give up until I had like gone through these 60, 70 rejections or whatever to finish the book or I took a year to really become a yoga teacher and I was uh, living in an uh, ashram with one dorm room of 60 people, one bathroom and like sleeping on the floors of the ashram because I was really wanting to master uh, the field. So I think if you choose detours in which you are really mastering a field, you'll go f grow so much from that mastery that you shouldn't think of it as leaving your job. You're just like choosing another stream to grow in. Right. And the world will eventually reward you for that, right? When I came back after my writing, the world did reward that I'd become very, I, I got uh, deepened my creative well, if you will, right? So mm. that. So mm. I think my advice is that uh, do the great resignation, but I think you should go towards something rather than leave something. So if you're resigning, then that's not a great success in itself. But if you are resigning to achieve mastery, 
in a new vector that will reward you very well but right. now yeah. that she has asked about re, you know resignation i just yeah. want to add there was this in huge yeah. debate on moonlighting yeah. what 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 are your views on that oh i so i don't know the particular debate because i read a so little like bit about you know, it and i am not getting your actually, second yeah. jobs yeah, 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 and yeah. and but do you think it uh, and a lot of yeah. tech companies actually yeah. were unhappy with their yeah. yes. employees the that employees are yeah. doing uh -huh. the second job yeah. and you know the employees are saying yeah. that we have time you yeah. know we can do it it, it allow us to sort yeah. of earn more yeah. uh, so i mean if 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 you have to say something on that what what would that be but i mean i think there are uh, if there is a conflict of interest with your current job then obviously it's not great right as an entrepreneur i would say that's a direct conflict of interest with what you're doing uh, but i would say i would highly encourage people i mean who, as a concept i'm asking as a con no as i say as a concept i would say i would highly encourage people who are growing significantly as human beings that's the kind of people you want as employees right now if they're growing significantly as human beings by making choices outside work i would love it i mean like for example i think uh, i would i don't know if it's moonlighting but after my job in procter and gamble i would come back and write for hmm. with a very lot of discipline is that moonlighting i don't know but i was just growing as a creative person which actually shaped my job a lot right. so i would highly encourage any moonlighting that makes a person deeper richer because that's a very valuable employee well one last so, question from my <laughs> end at least yes. uh you know as, as far as again i'm yes, coming yes. back to indian startups the center as well as state you know these governments they yes. are trying and they at least they claim that you know we are we have taken a number of measures to ensure you know they flourish in india yeah. do you think it is important uh, for startups that uh, the startup ecosystem that you get support from the government or do you think that you know startup should be on their own there is nothing that is required from the government end i'll tell you um, it's a interesting question i ran a startup myself and at that point of time i didn't even know what the government incentives etc were because um, i mean like you were just obsessed with your work and you were trying to get it uh, going and i like i wasn't really focused on that now i'm a special advisor for the goa government exactly and yeah. uh, from that vantage point i think a government who's creating an enabling policy framework for startups is valuable right so um, i think the both both things are valuable like startups have to survive based on the market government can't help them survive that's the reality and the market is ruthless and brutal and users don't pay for things easily and this as i said you've created something like a dramatically superior experience and no government can save you from that on the other hand enabling policy frameworks can make states very attractive for different startups for sure I, as i can see from my own experience right now Yeah. yeah going back to education yes, since yes, i write on it <laughs> and you've studied from some of the most notable institutions yeah. in the country you you've been a student at bits you've been a student at i am yeah. you you're a parent you have children and yeah. then your startup focused on learning for yes. children so and you also mentioned that you know this what you see your children studying was not yeah. very far away or Correct. different from what you study yeah. so where do you think the indian education especially the primary higher secondary education system needs to go in order to be where maybe where it needs to be or where yeah. it's at par with international education i think the new education policy is very forward thinking like whenever i whatever i studied of it i, I thought it was extremely forward thinking because it's all about creativity and abstraction in a world where all predictable jobs with predictable inputs and outputs will be automated the world will be shaped by people who build and create who's who are combining the left and the right brain and when i look at the nep and i look at some of the work some of the state governments are doing they're going in that direction well it's a journey changing education system was not easy in the us also new maths versus old maths i think there was a debate for decades so um, but i think it's it's rightly intended but but right but you know implementation is the, is the uh, key course, i mean yeah, and, you know yeah, nep we've correct. been hearing yes, about yes, it for yes. quite some time but even despite yes. you know all of that rote learning is something yeah. that you know people uh, at least have to focus on for to clear yeah. say the you know competitive exams and also yeah. do you think implementation is also something that yeah. you know governments should focus on i mean i understand yeah. policies are there but but the implementation of it or maybe something that you're yeah. adding yeah. to the goa government with yeah. your insights. your initiative or uh, i can say that that's i was about to say that which you mentioned in working for the last few months with the goa government and working with the honorable chief minister very closely and he's such a open guy i think uh, i think like it's such a gap that our private public interaction is almost there is hardly anybody who bridges the gap from private to public sector right to imagine that a bureaucrat who's had a like like you know who's lived in the bureaucracy throughout will suddenly you know come up with some great uh, hmm. like without a, a lot of like 
symbiosis with industry and startups and creativity and knowing uh, like it's very hard so i think if more and more people become that bridge between the private and the public sector i think things happen the good thing i've seen which i think is a mind opening thing for me is that uh, i've never seen government so open i could okay. never have imagined in india when i was growing up i'm probably a decade older than you or maybe more i would never have imagined in india when i was growing up where like a chief ministers would be competing with each other for the best ideas to move their states open forward open to ideas i think it's a brilliant time you know so to be uh, in a country where like uh, you know the heads of states are so wanting innovation want to compete with other heads of state separate themselves with very innovative measures and i think people like us who uh, who are able to transcend uh, to the other side it's very satisfying for you as an individual and very helpful hopefully for the governments you know <laughs> yes yeah and just one last question yeah. why why should someone read this who is your targeted audience my target audience would be like anybody who was like me in their 20s and 30s uh, whose soul was pulling themselves to unusual directions and uh, like you know i i remember you so know, i feel like remember very classic moments right when my mother said that look uh, you you know don't try to be an american you are an indian you can't just like take off a year to do backpacking or i remember like being in a gathering with my you know like uh, my family and i think somebody made a comment that they would never want their kids to grow up like me rootless at 35 you know like uh, no roots anywhere so i i felt like all the time in my 20s and 30s i kept hearing why yoga meditation you should not do backpacking you should not do writing you should not do like uh, you know leaving your job for a startup thankfully that's become more mainstream but you should not do but so i my i guess audience is that anybody who wants to live this whole pursuit i can tell you that those winding routes lead to the same outcomes or maybe even better outcomes than the more predictable routes because they kind of fill your world with uh, creativity and ambiguity and acceptance of ambiguity so i think that's i hope everybody reads it for that reason and that reason alone. well we can't let you go without asking what would be your advice to young entrepreneurs in india uh, my advice to young entrepreneurs or every, anybody who wants to be an entrepreneur is that startups are on the edges of a system not anything that's at the center of a system is being done by a big company or 10 other people are doing it so your idea will always be at the edge of a system and you'll be rejected because nobody knows what will go from the edge to the center and the only way to know whether it should work is to launch the first version of the product quickly and the moment you get one paying user or five paying users you can get a million paying users all over the world so i think my world view is don't ask too many people ki idea acha hai ya nahi hai plunge into it <laughs> go and it. go for it quickly get a get 5 7 paying users and then have the confidence that i can get 5 7 million paying users because it's exactly the same process that i took to convince them that my product is good that you need to convince 7 million other people then well thank you yeah. so much mr bajaj it was quite quite <laughs> enlightening thank you sonia thank you neelam thank yeah. you sonia